Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is about investing, and specifically it's about investing in gold and silver for private individual investors and savers. I think investing in gold and silver is a really, really important and useful way of protecting your savings or investments against inflation and the dangers of inflation. I remember um, as a kid, uh, must, this must have been late 70s, early 1980s, um, a conversation that made a really big impression on me where I was talking to um, an old man who I'm guessing was in his 70s and I think he was a caretaker or a porter of building or something like that. And he was telling me about how he had retired many years before, but the value of his pension had been totally destroyed by inflation to the point where he couldn't afford to live off his pension anymore and he had to go back to work. And that was why he had the job that he had. I'm guessing he must have had a fixed income pension um, and he must have retired in the early 1970s. And then because the 1970s was a time of very significant inflation, um, he had then had the value of his life savings, his pension eroded to the point where he had to go back to work. And it made a big impression on me at the time because um, I, I remember thinking as a kid, how can that happen? How can it work that someone's you know, life savings can be sort of destroyed like that? And I think this is a relevant um, threat um, in all times, but particularly in our times as we are now living in sort of the Great Depression um, since 2008. And since we're also living in a time where there has been massive increases in the supply of money by pretty much all Western governments. They call it quantitative easing, and there are lots of other words that are used for it, but essentially it's the printing of money, which is what leads to inflation. So I think this is relevant for anybody who is working towards creating as much financial freedom for themselves as, the, as they can and who wants to save for the future. Um, investing in gold and silver is one way of protecting um, your savings from the threat of inflation. And this podcast is a discussion amongst from myself and a group of friends, all of whom invest in precious metals to one extent or another. And we talk about some of the practicalities that we face as individual investors. And I think those practical uh, issues will be faced by anybody who's interested in investing in gold and silver. So I hope that this is useful for you if you are currently thinking of or already investing. And there's a good book that is a good introduction called uh, Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver by Mike Maloney, which we talk about during the discussion, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Everyone on this call is you know, quite convinced of the value of investing in gold and silver in these times. And we do, you know, we have some debates on the call about different aspects of investing, but you may find it useful to seek out other views. There are other views on the subject. Some people believe that because the value of gold has been rising for 12 years now, that it's in a bubble and that now would be a terrible time to invest in precious metals. Pretty much everyone on the call thinks that although the value has been rising, there's a long way further for, um, for gold and silver to be revalued, um, given the amount of, of money printing that's going on at the moment. So obviously, nobody on the call is providing any kind of qualified financial advice of any type. None of us are registered financial advisors or brokers or dealers or securities dealers or anything like that. So... This is just provided as opinion to help you formulate your own views about investment. And obviously, we're not responsible for what you do with your money. This is just for information purposes. So I hope that you find it useful and that it can form part of the many views that you take into account before making up your own mind about investing. And with that said, I hope you enjoy the discussion. Thank you so much for listening. So I, I'm curious to um, just to start off to ask you guys who on the call who has gold at the moment is it everyone here already have they already invested in gold or thinking about it or what stage are you guys at already invested cool yeah I'm also I'm all <laughs>
That's interesting. So this is a uh, a gold a gold members call. <laughs> gold bugs. A gold and silver. Gold and silver too. Yeah, oh, that's. I'm cool. actually I'm actually in a gold mine right now. <laughs> you're, you're currently panning. <laughs> I decided to skip the middle man, you know? Invested or mining? <laughs> Just inhale that nice black dust there, Christoph. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah, what, what is silicosis again? <laughs> cool. Well, I, I've got a question for you guys then, because, um, I, I mean, obviously, this whole discussion is like we're all investing in gold. I'm very heavily invested in gold as well. So, I, you know, I, I totally buy the um the importance of of um of having gold um and also i see the probability of hyperinflation um and of the rise in value of gold uh, you know a massive rise in the value of gold as being very high but i want to ask you um what about gold and silver then i mean what is your like what are your strategies or experiences in holding gold versus silver do you have a particular ratio of your holdings that you have thought about um you know how did you decide to hold x gold and and y silver because i mean for me i'm i'm genuinely interested in this for myself because i have been investing in gold i started in 2007 and gold is something i think is a very important part of my portfolio i haven't yet really invested in silver and interestingly, reading this book is the, one of the first um, times where, not as part of my main portfolio, but just purely as a speculation, I may um, invest in silver. But since you guys, you know, are all sort of, you know, precious metal interested people, what is your strategy for how much gold you have versus how much silver you have and why? I initially was all gold, too. And um, I moved into silver. Um, well, I moved into the physical possession of silver primarily because in the event of, you know, shit hitting the fan, I wanted something that I could barter with. There really was no type of, I want a certain percentage of gold versus a certain percentage of silver in my precious metals account. It was more, I want to have some silver coins on hand in case shit hits the fan and I have to barter with someone to buy food or buy, you know, some good of some kind. Right. So this is really very much a, you know, it's going to be easier for me to be having small um, units of silver walking around trying to get some food than trying to show someone a little lump of gold and, and get some food type of situation. As I was going to say, I can't imagine um, walking around with American Gold Eagle is going to do me much good when I want to buy a sandwich. You know? <laughs> yeah, <That's>... right, right. <laughs> that would have to be a really, really big sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> or you walk in with an American Eagle and you say, listen, I'm, I'm interested in sandwiches over the next mm, maybe six <laughs> months, a year. <laughs> can you open up your book so I can make sure that you're going to be good and financially solvent two years from now so I'm going to get my sandwich contract fulfilled? <laughs> maybe, maybe if you want to buy the sandwich shop itself. <laughs> That's also an option. There's a subway right right by my apartment, so that, that could be the case. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I read a book about the uh, Weimar hyperinflation, and you're joking about it, but it's it's not that unrealistic. I mean, it's if that if, if it's if it's going to be really bad, it makes sense to know a farmer. <laughs> oh yeah, I completely agree. I completely understand what you're saying. You want to have some silver so that you have you know something tangible to barter with so you've got now you've got some silver so now as time goes on how do you decide whether to buy more silver or more gold i mean what do you do you is it just you know do you have a strategy there or how's it working out for you i wish i could tell you had a strategy <laughs> <laughs> i just you know it's like well i bought some gold last day maybe i should buy some silver you know it's like there is for me there isn't much in the way of like a major strategy Right. When it comes to uh, what I buy and when, it's just like, how much money do I have on hand? What's the price? Eh, you know, I like round numbers, too. This, <laughs> my, right. my, um, my, <laughs> my gold and silver investment strategy is unraveling before your very eyes. But <laughs> it's like, well, let me round it off to a straight even number so I have enough, you know. <laughs> 
No, I tell you, anybody who's been investing in gold for as long as you have has uh, has got no- nothing to uh, n- nothing to be ashamed of. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to strategy and to where and when to buy, I'm just it's all guesswork, frankly. Right. So I, I when I um, invest, I actually have a, a ratio in mind, and I. I find the um, the arguments about uh, silver having more of an uh, an upswing than gold to be very persuasive mm. um, in terms of the trends in in industrial demand the um, the the fact that there's so little silver available um, uh, both in terms of what's above above ground and. Uh, the fact that uh, so much of the industrial consumption of silver is not recyclable, um, right. as opposed to you know gold doesn't have the investment, uh, doesn't have the industrial demand, or something like copper is extremely recyclable. Um, so it's it's very different in that respect. The historical ratio between silver and gold is you know interesting to look at as well, and uh, I also see the the strongest case for market manipulation in the case of. Uh, silver. I'm, I'm a little bit more skeptical about the the uh, manipulations in terms of gold, um, right. at least in, in this current decade. So. so can I ask, just out of interest, what ratio of your own holdings you're trying to keep? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I aim for a two to one ratio in sil- silver to gold. Um, and the silver that I own, I try to physically possess in order to avoid counterparty risk. Mm. Um, And then for gold, um, just because it's such a, it's such an easy target for theft and that kind of thing. um, It's, it's it's worth so much in in such small uh, quantities. Mm. Um, I try to uh, hold a little bit of gold, but also, um, I have some in, in pool accounts as well, and I try to geographic, geographically diversify in terms of the, the pool accounts that I'm in. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. With something okay. like, like Bullion Vault or something like that. Yeah, a Bullion Vault. Um, I have uh, invested in their uh, vault, which is in Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland, yeah. Because yeah. I just I feel like that's the most politically stable uh, place in terms of... of respect for private property. Yeah, I have and... gold sitting next to yours in that vault. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And also uh, goldmoney.com, uh, they have vaults in Hong Kong, which is another, to me, another interesting place politically in terms of um, a good place to have vaults. Um, the other vaults that I've seen are kind of like in the UK and uh, mm. I don't forget what the other places that I, maybe the US or something like that, but I'm a little bit more concerned about those kind of places in terms of um, confiscation. So. Now, when you say two to one, you're talking about current monetary value. So in other words, if you see your silver spike in value massively and next time you go to, to add to your holdings, will you then say, I'm now going to invest in gold because the silver spike has, has – is that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. In terms of U.S. dollars, um, right. that's just the happens to be the standard, and that's that's kind of arbitrary. It's just because I live and yeah, sure. use, use U.S. currency all the time. But uh, yeah, I mean, if I saw a silver spike, you know, really heavily relative to gold, um, then I would I would either decide to balance things out, or or I might re-examine my uh, the ratio that I'm. Um, using and that really depends on my opinion on where i expect the trend to be from there if i feel mm-hmm. like you know it's corrected about as much as it's going to correct then you know at that point i'm going to be investing more in gold if i expect it to continue in that direction then uh, maybe it will be more of a ratio three to one or four to one or whatever and you're holding twice as much value in silver as gold is that right yeah right right cool thank you so much for sharing that's very interesting to to hear your your thoughts behind you know, how you've approached it. I also, just to add one more thing in there uh, for silver, I think that um, uh, since I'm persuaded by all these arguments about where it's going to go um, compared to gold, it's extremely cheap right now compared mm. to gold, if, if those expectations are accurate. Mm. Um, and so um, part of my bias of buying more silver right now is that I, I want to take advantage of that cheapness as much as possible. Yes, yeah. Um, what, while it while it's good, I, I basically feel like 
the the government and the stock markets and JP Morgan and all these people are um, putting silver on sale for me right now. And so I want to take opportunity of the sale. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I thought that was a very interesting argument in this book about the historical imbalance in silver to gold price. And uh, so, yeah, that's a, that's really interesting. And I do find that argument quite quite persuasive as well. It's a very interesting one. Yeah, I'm I'm also about two two um, parts in silver and one part in gold. Right. And my my reasoning is is uh, not so different from uh, I think Christopher's his name. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, but I would add that for me, uh, I think also silver has more potential uh, in price uh, um, appreciation. Um, but for me, it's um, I, it, because it's it's more than fifty percent um, used in, in for economic pur- purposes. Um, it's dependent on how the world economy uh, does, and I think when a financial collapse happens, uh, it will affect um, the um, the workings of the of the productive sector. Mm. the economy and i think then will the the request for silver the um will, will go down and the uh, investment um what's the word <laughs> request no um, uh, demand. demand demand yeah, yeah. The, the investment demand will go up and it's not so clear for me whether this will be Cancelling each other out, right? Or it will the investment demand will will out outgrow this this falling demand on the economic side. Mm. So it's it's not so clear cut. So it's it's very attractive in in I think because it's it's it will go up, but in the very end it's d- difficult to see when when um, the peak will be there. So that's. That's a reservation I have. have uh, right, right. Silver, and for gold, there's. But you, not... so, sorry, to, to, sorry to interrupt, but just so, just despite that reservation, you still feel that it's worth having twice as much silver as as gold, so to speak. Yes, because that reservation is only valid in the very end, and I don't think we're cl- very we're close to the very end. Right. I, I think it's it's still some years. So I'm very calm having having a lot of silver. Mm. And I I I first bought only silver. And then after a while I thought maybe maybe they will, they will come overnight to a gold standard. Mm. And uh, then of course gold will appreciate very much and maybe more than silver. And so I thought okay, maybe it's not bad to have some some gold at least. And it's also not as volatile. Mm. And that's uh, also good um, in explaining it to my wife what I'm doing. With <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean it's not. I'm not on my own here, and <laughs> it's all hard, hard-earned money. Yeah, when you when you have to come downstairs in in the morning and, and see the papers, and or, or go online and say. Honey, uh, remember what I told you we have in the bank yesterday? <laughs> uh, it's changed. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I I went um, through the uh, stock market crash in 2007 or 2008, it was, mm. and we lost about 45% of our value. Oh, oh man. I just, I just, we were uh, in vacation, <laughs> and I just saw the headlines, and I was, I was not interested in my fa- finances. I just put the money there and let it sit there. Mm. And Luckily, I did that um, continue. And in 2010, I had regained all the value. So I lost only three years of inflation, but I had the nominal value back without doing anything. So I, it, it, it saved me a lot of stress, but I knew that I was not, I was not able to manage the money. And so <laughs> I, this time I, I did want to do it better. And <laughs> I think I, I do now, but that's still the argument to to avoid um, um, or, or to cap the volatility a bit. Yeah, absolutely. No, and also you know it's uh, it's easier to sleep I think when there's less volatility because that uh, certainly can be a bit of an adrenaline rush when uh, when things change so drastically. 
Yeah, but um, I mean, I, I'm in the first year of, of precious metal investing, so I I, I still have to. Uh, it's easy for me to lose money when when yes. with the bubble the bubble pops. But there is no bubble, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I experienced the the crash in silver in in April, I think it was, where it was shortly under fifty dollars mm -hmm. per ounce. Mm -hmm. And I had this. Uh, I experienced the crash in in gold when it was shortly below nineteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And I both in both cases I I, I foresaw that because it it um, uh, they were the metals were trading way above the the two hundred day moving averages. Mm -hmm. And I, I swapped I swapped my gold for my silver, or I swapped my silver for my gold. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I was very lucky because I, I'm not always looking at the screen and not, not every day. And but I I mean, it 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 ran for a while, and it, and you could see it if you were informed. Um, yeah, it's it's possible. I mean, it's difficult to do that, but but um, yeah, silver and gold are not trading always. Um, uh, in line with and then in lockstep with each other mm. so you can take opportunity of that um, yeah yeah but but it will not always uh, work of course were you able to do that because it was uh you're using some kind of all mine account or are you talking about physical bullion or oh that was on bullion vault well, you've got your gold sitting next to ours then in, in switzerland presumably yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah our gold it's all having a party <laughs> yeah, and but I um, I have some coins, of course, uh, in reach, and um, uh, also for the reason to to uh, in case of an emergency to be able to barter. Mm. So I have one ounce silver coins, um, and that will I mean that will be will lasting for for several months to to buy food. Um, but I have also some gold coins, and uh, but that was just uh, because I was not um, really well informed. Um, because I, I mean, you you need in uh, in Europe you don't need to pay um, uh, taxes on on gold coins, and so I first bought gold coins. Mm. But I don't think it's it's a good idea to have gold coins around. It's it's not for the same reason that they're not that they're not really going to be useful for small transactions. You mean? Yes, and and yeah, and it's difficult to get rid of them. I mean, it's, yeah, if you want to sell them on eBay, you you have to to pay a lot of uh, commission and yeah it's it's difficult and yeah. it's, you have to insure them and send them and it's a risk and uh it's a hassle so i mm. i regret that yeah i was interested to see that that um, both christoph and heike were both about twice as much silver as gold and what what did you say that yours was at the moment like what kind of ratio do you know do you have at the moment I just pulled it up while everyone was talking about it, and I'm three to one gold to silver. Interesting, interesting. Because initially, I just I put everything in gold, mm. and I mean, I was aware that silver was far more volatile, and um, mm. and I don't know to what degree that you know, in hindsight, that really influenced my decision. Silver is almost like an afterthought to me, like gold. You know, the gold standard. This is what everyone's talking about. Well, that's um, pretty much where I'm at because I'm like mm -hmm. ninety nine point nine percent gold to um, to silver. I've only I've just only just um, because I just seen that I can actually buy it on bullion vault as well. I just bought mm -hmm. a little bit of silver, but it's negligible. Um, sure. So um, so yeah, I, I very much um, came from background of of uh, you know reading about gold's role and um yeah i'm i'm very interested in silver um following this discussion it's uh it's really helpful for me to hear your 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 the experience of you guys i wanted to ask you also this would be interesting for me i, I think some of you know that i have a permanent portfolio so i'm following the kind of harry brown idea which basically means that i have 25 percent of my investments in gold and so of my total portfolio, um, I have 25% in gold. It's not entirely true because I also have some um, other investments as well. But, um, uh, but that's the chunk of, of my basic portfolio. And I was interested to ask, like, I know, I think Mike is pretty much. I'm all in, baby. You're all in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're Mr. Precious Metals. You're, you're like 100%, right? Uh, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you guys, you know, what, what percentage of your portfolios are, are precious metals? Yeah, I'm also very much all in. 
I still have a life insurance, which, which I'm not sure if that's a good investment. Um, so I'm thinking about um, yeah, selling that with, with a big, big loss, but uh, yeah, that's a different story. And I have some cash, of course. Yeah. Uh, if the car breaks down or so, then I don't have to sell in a, uh, when, when uh, a correction is. Yes. Um, but yeah. it's not, not so much. We had, we had just a very expensive uh, engine repair, so <laughs> that's drawn down. But so are you talking like 10% cash or like what would you say just approximately what do you because I hold I hold quite a lot of cash I'm actually 25% cash but what is your what is your cash ratio Yeah I mean you you do it for for investment reason because it's it's part of the permanent portfolio but I'm just I just want to be liquid um uh and 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 for for uh, expensive um uh, uh, bills, yeah, but it's. I think, yeah, it's actually maybe about a ten percent only. Ten percent, right? Ten right. percent, yeah. It may be maybe ten or eight percent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. That's very interesting. Very interesting. How about you, Christoph? Um. So I, I have some cash. I, I try to keep it lowish, um, just enough to make sure that if I have, I don't know, a medical emergency or something, I can pay the bills right away. Um, other than that, uh, um, I'm in precious metals. Um, at some point, um, um, once I sort of hit my goals for uh, uh, bullion, I'm interested in leveraging with mining stocks, um, which mm -hmm. are you know still precious metals, but a little bit different than the... Uh, um, the bullion kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always curious about things like, uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I can't imagine um, uh, intentionally investing in cash at this point. Um, I, I do follow the uh, news around the foreign exchange and stuff and, and so forth. And I just, I'm not short enough term trader um, to, to put anything in cash. Um, so you you pretty much also like um, Heiko and Mike. You're pretty much more or less like ninety percent precious, and then some maybe some cash. Is that right? Or right, right. I'm interested in investing as well as my permanent portfolio. Investing additionally, a bit more in um, in uh, precious metals, just because I I do believe that you know. That, I mean, I've already got precious metals in the permanent portfolio to protect me in the event of the shit hitting the fan. But I hold that probability to be so high that I'm essentially speculating more. I, I want to speculate more of my portfolio on that actually taking place. Yeah, the idea of you having 25% in cash, when you said that, Jake, I just, I, I always shudder. I just like, there's something that makes me very uncomfortable about that. Well, you say that, but, you know, the interesting thing is that... Um, I mean, it, it's helped me a couple of times um, because, um, as Heiko said, you know, he, he lost a lot of value in his stocks and then they recovered over those over that period of, that, of time. Right. I lost value in my stocks, too. And because they fell as a proportion of my portfolio, I then invested at the bottom and I got to ride the wave up again as as they recovered a bit. They didn't, you know, it wasn't. It's not like a boom in stocks, but just that little recovery after two thousand and eight. Sure. I actually did pretty well out of that, and I, that that was possible because I had cash on hand to take advantage of rebalancing opportunities. You know, I think that's consistent with Mike Maloney's approach to a large extent as well, because he's all about the cycles, and he said in the book that in the long run he doesn't care about gold; he wants to get into property. Uh, how, into property, right? Housing yeah. and and, uh, and whatnot. And I so, think, I think that you're, it sounds like you're doing that just on a, a shorter uh, scale than than he is. Absolutely. I mean, this is the funny thing: is that there's a chapter in this book um, where he talks about. A family, he gives this allegory of what if there was this family, one of whom invested in the stock market and another of whom had a balanced portfolio between uh, stocks and gold, where whenever it became overvalued between stocks and gold, they would switch out into the other asset class over the 20th century. Now, it's very interesting that he didn't, you know, he didn't choose to pit and a stocks only person against the gold only person he chose to pit a stocks only against the stocks and gold right so he already has 
a hedging strategy or a balanced portfolio in there. In that concept is is in there in his idea of how you take advantage of the rise of different you know bubbles and 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 ride the waves up and sell at the top and so forth. And so, like the interesting thing for me is that those are the two kind of linchpins of the permanent portfolio: the gold and the stocks. The cash is really there because in a recession, cash is actually the the I mean, especially a tight money recession. Whether we'll ever get one again. But in a tight money recession, cash is the only thing that, you, that, that would actually hold value. And the bonds are there because in a depression type environment um, like the 1930s, that's really what that's the one asset class that did well. In a sense, the permanent portfolio is, is a, like a slightly more sophisticated version of what Mike Maloney's talking about in that chapter. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that, but it's interesting that you point that out. I mean, it's not exactly a fair fight of uh, stocks versus stocks and gold. I mean, it... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm curious about like when to get out. Um, that's of gold. Uh, yeah, like in in the long term. Yeah, and as also um, Mike Maloney said that he's not in gold. Like it doesn't rise forever. Like this is not. Maybe people are saying that, that um, but we know also that the property market didn't rise until the end of the world. Yeah. Well, this is a, a that is a very good question because I mean, and it sort of ties back to what I was just talking about because the permanent portfolio. I mean, the interesting thing about it is that you automatically sell your most highly valued assets when they're most highly valued because you rebalance when they get you know when it when anything gets to become 35 percent of your total holding you rebalance it down to 25 percent i would be really interested to know what you guys think about yeah when are you going to sell your gold and because uh if you don't have a a portfolio balancing strategy like that then you have to make a conscious decision like now i feel is the right time so how will you guys know when to sell your gold? When everybody up and down the street is talking about gold and silver and precious metal investment, I'll know the bubble is uh, at its peak and that will be time to sell and uh, buy my dream house somewhere. Right, right. <laughs> that's, that's kind of my unscientific approach because, you know, when you see it on the news constantly and they're constantly mentioning the gold price and, you know, everyone's talking about it. That's that's the height. Right. You know? Right. Yeah, I did. I did actually think that was a very nice comment in his book that he says he sort of says a similar thing that in the 1970s, there were queues around the block to buy gold. And when mm. I, I think he even says, you know, when you see those queues, that's when the time to sell. <laughs> yep. Right now, it seems like, uh, I mean, the, people keep saying that they think there's a gold bubble right now. But when I look at the stores that are around me um, where I live, it's mostly like, sell us your gold jewelry for way under spot price because you don't know anything about, you know, financial stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are a few people wising up, which is why those those shops, are, they're springing up everywhere. They spring up here as well, those shops. Um, but yeah, it's not the case. He makes another nice point in the book, which is like, just think about how many people in your town own gold. And yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It's what is it? One to no 10,000 or yeah. one to 5,000? Yeah. Is that also that is fascinating to think about? Yeah, it really that's, it's absolutely fascinating. It does kind of mean that you maybe have to keep your, your, you know, your finger on the pulse a little bit, you know, cause I don't read any financial media. So maybe I'm gonna have to watch it to, to decide when to sell, you know? <laughs> So when are you going to sell? Well, uh, I mean, I, d I definitely do uh, want to keep my pulse on um, what what percentage of the populace uh, is is you know investing in it. Yeah. Um, and then other than that, I'll be looking at all of the um, the trends that I think are going to cause um, uh, an upswing in in prices if if that if they come about if they come to fruition and I see them uh, topping off um, then then I'll consider selling you know if if I if the U S goes back on a gold standard that would you know that might be a indication to me that it's time to sell gold um, if uh, someone uh, invents a new metal alloy that completely replaces silver then. <laughs> you know, one of my one of my strong um, 
you know, uh, incentives for investing in silver is the industrial application. So if it gets replaced industrially, then that would be a concern as well. So um, I sort of want to keep track of all, all of those different things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would I would look also on uh, the number of ounces I need to pay for a median priced house. That's one one measure. Yes, absolutely. The price of things in gold, the uh, real things. Yeah, or silver. So if if that's uh, if it's if that's becoming real cheap, and I have the impression that uh, housing prices are not gonna uh, fall, then uh, investment in in real estate will become interesting for me. So your ultimate end game is to get out into real estate. You think is that is that where you will go? Yeah, that way. Yeah, that would be one one way to go because uh, yeah that would be a place to live i mean i i'm renting mm. for now and i'm not i have no capital for uh for um yeah buying a house or and if that's if that's achievable for me i would be would be considering myself lucky because i i can use i can use this property yeah sure sure and uh, oh, that that use, uh that brings up a, a question that I wanted to to ask other people, um, which is um, at one point in the book, Mike Maloney says, you know, stop thinking about gold in terms of its dollar price. Think about it in terms of the amount of stuff that you can buy with it. And then he doesn't give you any suggestion for how to go about measuring that. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, what, what do people, if people think that's a valid idea, and if, if so, um, what kind of measurements would they use to, uh, try to, to gauge that. I guess um, you know, real estate prices would be one of those. I think he uh, suggests uh, also the median priced house mm. uh, to gold ratio, and as well the Dow Jones to gold ratio. Yeah, maybe some others as well. But I don't know. I think the um, the median priced house to gold is absolutely fascinating. You know, it's really interesting to see, like, and it sort of makes it a lot more tangible for me as well, you know, what what's going on in the world when you kind of think, when you can understand how much um, gold you need to buy um, a, you know, a house or something tangible like that. It, it really sort of puts in perspective um, what's happening in, in, the, in, the, in the economy, you know. So, yeah. I is the, is the idea there that, is he saying... Okay, so uh, when you sell your gold, you can buy a bunch of median uh, priced houses and then rent them out. Because I yes, exactly. Or, that's that's what he that, Heiko's talking about buying one just to live in. But he's talking. He he says his ultimate aim is to to buy a bunch of uh, rental properties. And I think that's partly because he's in with Robert Kiyosaki, who's really into real estate and uh, thinks real estate investing is uh, super duper. So I think that's partly maybe why that's tagged onto this book, because it's part of the Rich Dad series. You know. Oh, right, right, and, right. Um, I, I, wanna, I want to you know, investigate uh, real estate investment some more, because I, when I think about that, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to become a landlord for a bunch of people. Like, that's not what my investment goal is, you know, dealing with uh, leaky sinks and, and trash neither. disposals all the time, you know? So. I, I think it's, I think it, you know, it's not an investment in the same way that gold stocks, bonds, these kinds of things are an investment. It's actually a business. If you go into becoming a landlord, it is a business. A real estate, I think you you know, you really need to understand that business and, and know your way around it. And if you don't, then if you go in as an amateur, I think it's, um, you know, you can really get burned because other people know the market better than you and so forth. So I agree with Harry Brown that real estate isn't really an investment in the same way as other asset classes. Um, however, I think it is a great thing to have a house and be able to live in it. And I totally understand where you're coming from, Heiko. But, um, but yeah, as an investment, I also, I don't really want to own houses and rent them out because that's a business. And, you know, I mean, if I was going to go into entrepreneurship and do something, that wouldn't be the first thing that would come to mind as being like an exciting venture for me to go into, um, where I felt like I had natural advantages. So why do I think I would be a particularly good real estate investor or, or, or landlord? Um, you know, so, yeah, I, I, I can see where you're coming from. Jake, I think you're, from my experience of landlords, you're just way too nice to be a landlord. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I yeah. think there are in there are possibilities in investing in real estate without having to be a landlord. I mean, closed funds or something like that. So I think that would be possible if if you think uh, real estate is totally undervalued and nobody's looking at it because everybody got burned in the housing bubble. And I mean, sometimes there will be a housing bubble again. And so uh, yes. it's good to be, uh, to be in it before it, it happens. Yes. Uh, REITs and so forth, real estate investment trusts and, and these kinds of things. Yeah, that's all possible. But I think a lot of people and indeed the Rich Dad book series um, is about buying properties to get rental income because they cash flow and because you can get then get income from it. And those those books, although I, I really like Robert Kiyosaki, I think he's a really bright guy, but those books that he wrote in the 90s feel to me more like 90s books when real estate yeah. was going, you know, when, when we were in a different, a slightly different world in terms of what the economy was like, right? And any almost anyone could get into real estate and see the value rise, and you really didn't need to know the market like, you know, any idiot could buy a house and watch the value rise, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. And many did. Yes, and many <laughs> did, yeah. And then watched it uh, plummet at the end. <laughs> well, I'm still stuck with the thought of wanting Jake as my landlord, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Hi, hey, Michael. This is this is Jake. Uh, where's my where's my goddamn money, <laughs> friend? Jake, can oh. you um, Jake, can we reenact the phone call where you threaten to break my kneecaps or something? <laughs> yeah. So I, I obviously I'm not in the landlord business for good reasons because I, I wouldn't be able to go and threaten with menacing, menacing looks. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I really appreciated getting your, your perspective, guys. It's very helpful. It's nice to have, um, you know, real precious metal enthusiasts on the phone who've, who've actually, uh, you know, committed to it and are living it because uh, it really helps me to see, um, you know, a different perspective on things. I... I value investing in gold very much, and it's a very important part of, of my strategy, but I haven't yet invested in silver, and certainly the conversation and reading the books given me a huge amount to think about, so it's been really helpful. So thank you so much for coming along. Yeah, it was a great conversation, guys. It was thank fun to dip us. back into this world of, of uh, you know, financial information, which I've kind of stayed away from <laughs> for the last little bit, so... Yeah, thanks for chatting, and we have to keep on keep our eyes open because when enthusiasts get together, we'll are likely to end up um, just boosting the same views. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, gold, gold, yeah, yeah gold, gold, and like, oh. yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, sh- uh, you know, it would have been good to have some some skeptics on, but uh, but there you go. You know, I think we do have to be careful that um, that, that things like. You know the the times when gold falls in value and 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 things like that. I think we we need to have a perspective where we can understand those things because otherwise you can get a bit wrapped up in the um in the sort of uh, uh well gold gold boosterism for want of a better word. I think people take on the gold bug thing as an identity a lot of times too. Yeah, yeah. Which definitely something I don't want to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean. You know, once you've tried to roll around in your gold coins once, you just don't want to do it again, really. It's, it's not very comfortable. Leave, you want to warm leave. them up first. <laughs> <laughs> the cold metal against your skin, just, no, you don't want to. Uh, words from rec- a pro, you I know. I recommend baby oil. <laughs> baby oil. <laughs> See, one of these days I'm going to have my Scrooge McDuck money bin, and I'm going to be able to do that swan dive right into a pile of gold coins. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> In fact, just before, you know, when the crisis does hit, just before you sell all your gold, you do have to lay it all out, you know, in a bath or in the bed, on the bed or something and then roll around in it. You know? like this I think my fiancé might leave me. The <laughs> duck world. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, it's been great fun talking to you guys. I hope you have a lovely rest of weekend and uh, look forward to talking to you soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Jake. Take care. Thanks for chatting. Really enjoyable chat. Thanks. Cheers, guys.